actually uh, changing a little bit. Uh, Mac is going to include in his message this morning a reading of the scripture. So uh, I will turn the service over to him and uh, let's hear what God has put on his heart this morning. Uh, thank you, Mac. Good morning, friends. Good morning. And uh, sometimes as we say, uh, just walking friends, we say, oh, ni uh, That's hello, my friend, in, in the true native language of, of the Shwaki. Nishwaki. Um, and that's about the extent of my, uh, my expertise of the Native American language of the Shwaki. It's a very difficult language. Um, it, it's a lot of tongue placement in the throat. Uh, the, the, the syllables have a tendency of wandering off. Uh, but, you know, and I, I don't even try. Uh, because at the last census, they, they said that less than 5% of Native American Meskwaki can speak conversational Meskwaki. And, and what a sad thing that is, that these people are losing the heritage. So I just wanted to share that with you. I also wanted to share with you some, uh, another term that we use at Meskwaki Friends is hola, amigo. And uh, you can tell by my friends that are here today, uh, right now, uh, I think our, our, our high school, middle school youth uh, has exceeded the 50% mark. Uh, we, we have as much Hispanic in our community as we do Native American. When Bernie and I were researching the fact that we're uh, considering uh, going to Tama, uh, one of the things uh, that we discovered was that 7% of the population of Tama County is Native American. And I thought that was a little strange. It seemed low to me because growing up as a child, you think of Tama, Iowa, you think of the settlement, you think of the casino, you just think of Native Americans. So I thought that was uh, strange, but maybe a little low. But then I also discovered that 7% of the population of Tama County is also Hispanic, due to the packing plant, the blue collar jobs in the Marshall Town area, uh, has brought a lot of those folks into our community. But one thing that I do want to share with you, uh, what we do at the Squawking Friends Church, and uh, everywhere I go, um, I have been a chaplain at the Eddieville Tax Strip. I've uh, been a pastor at Pleasant Plain Friends. Uh, I, take, I take chapel services to the nursing home and assisted living. But one thing that we say, and that we highlight, you know, well, what we say is, I, I can't be too far off my leash. Uh, but I do walk around uh, occasionally. What we do say is, it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter where you've been. You're always welcome here at College Avenue Friends. And, and I truly believe that. No matter where I go to take a message, I believe that everyone is welcome. And what that says is, it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter where you've been. It doesn't matter where, who you are, how bad you think you've been, how good you think you've been. You're always welcome in a worship service that I'm at. I extend that invitation. I would encourage you to extend that invitation to your friends and family members throughout your community. Maybe they're going through a difficult time. Maybe they need to know that, you know, there's that church over on Sea Avenue, the big pillars out front. It's a little intimidating. But, you know, everyone is welcome to join us here. Thank you. I got it. It worked that time. Run. Okay. Um, I don't know how many people actually know who I am. Uh, I'm Matt McDonald, my wife, Bert, Scott knows who I am. Uh, but I wanted to kind of give you an idea of who we are and how we got to where we're at today. Um, um, I grew up in New Providence, at uh, Honey Creek New Providence Friends Church. This picture is uh, pre-1972. Uh, that's the church that I went to uh, before they erected the new building that they're worshiping in now. Uh, I, I grew up pretty, pretty normal, um, <laughs> <laughs> living in a town of 200 people. Uh, I would like to let you know this is a picture of the Roundhouse, the gymnasium at New Providence Community School. Okay. <laughs> uh, this is the Roundhouse. Uh, we like to refer to it as the Dome. It was probably the first dome in Iowa. Uh, it's still there. It's still more of a community center. Uh, the school building has been torn down. I was the last class to graduate from uh, New Providence Community School. And I like to tell people I graduated in the top 10 of my class. <laughs> if you're familiar with New Providence, there was 13 in my class. And I'm sure there was three of those people that I beat out for that uh, glorious uh, <laughs> title that I hold. 
Um, once graduating high school, I really didn't know what I wanted to do. I went to Ellsworth Community College for one year. Uh, it was a mutual understanding between the college and myself that I'd not come back. <laughs> I thought they were being unreasonable. Uh, so I ended up joining the military. Uh, I served in the United States Marine Corps uh, from, uh, for, for 20 years. I enlisted in, uh, in, in 83, had an opportunity to retire in 2003. Uh, the photo I'm showing you here take, was taken somewhere around March 1st, 1991. Uh, that was in the middle of Desert Storm. That photo was taken in front of the U.S. Embassy in Kuwait City. Uh, this was the day the ground war had ended. We were downtown Kuwait City. Uh, I went to the embassy. Uh, I thought maybe I'd get a cold bottle of water. There was nobody home. Uh, but I was able to get my photograph taken in front of the U.S. Embassy. Shortly after this point in my life, it started to spiral down. Things started getting chaotic. I wasn't leading a Christian life by any stretch of the imagination. By the year 2000, my marriage uh, was failing. My life was falling apart. And, and, and some of the reasons that was happening was because of the uh, alcohol abuse, uh, PTSD that I, that I suffered from uh, being in service, and also being in unloving relationships. In 2008, I turned my life completely around. And this is what I prayed. God, I offer myself to you to build with me and to do with me as you will. Relieve me of the bondage of myself that I may better do your will. Take away my difficulties that victory over them will be a witness to those I would help. Of your will, your love, and your way of life, may I do your will always. You know, I spoke to my lawyer earlier this week, and he said, uh, you know, is there a scripture you want me to put? Is there, is there a title uh, that you wanted me to share? And I said, no, I'm not, not kind of, not really. Uh, just moving with the Spirit. And uh, he asked me, he said, well, are there, are there any special hymns? And I said, no, not, not really. But I thought it was amazing that the last hymn that we sung, sung Living for Jesus, the, uh, the chorus goes, Oh, Jesus, Lord and Savior, I give myself to Thee. For Thou and Thy atonement didst give Thyself for me. I owe, no, I owe no other master. My heart be thy throne. My life I give henceforth to live. O Christ, for thee alone. Very similar, that prayer and that song. And I'm, I'm sure God moved in my to play that song in reference to the message I have for you today. Like I said, I turned my life around. In 2000. Nothing. Bernie Knight joined an organization called Iowa Speedway Ministries. At the Iowa Speedway in Newton, Iowa, they do have Iowa Speedway Ministries. And what we do is we, we're all volunteers. We help out uh, around the track. We drive uh, handicapped golf carts uh, from the handicapped parking area to the gates of the, of the racetrack. We had a, a very large, I like to call it a circus tent, that was donated by Vermeer uh, Manufacturing in Apollo. Uh, we put that tent up. It's kind of an iconic marker on, on the uh, on the race grounds uh, from the chapel tent. We go here. And we had a whole chapel services there, uh, and we took on responsibilities. Bernie had a, uh, a, a booth set up on the concourse of the racetrack area, and uh, people thought it was an information booth because we always knew where the restrooms were, where, where the, you know, the t-shirt stands were, where that driver parks at, or how do you get on the shelf. Uh, but you know, there's other opportunities there as well. Uh, we had the little temporary tattoos, and to put a temporary tattoo on a young child and hold their hand for just that short period of time and offer them a blessing. And what how rewarding that was. It really felt like God wanted us to do more. And while I was at the Iowa Speedway, the uh, Speedway Ministry said, This is all volunteer work. Uh, somebody in our organization thought I'd be a good chaplain for the organization we served, which was Racers for Christ. And uh, I said, Well, I'm, I'm willing to serve. So I submitted an application with them. Um, they accepted my application as a chaplain. And the first thing they wanted me to do was, why don't you go down to Eddyville, Iowa? Because at the drag strip there, they don't have a chaplain. In previous race season, they had a fatality accident, and they didn't know how to deal with it. They didn't know how to deal with the trauma and, and the family that was involved in that accident. And I said, I'm not sure I can either, but I'm willing to go where God sends me. Again, things in our life can turn around. Things were getting much better. We were serving God in a volunteer chaplain 
uh, type position, but I really felt like God wanted to give me more. He had more for me to do. In 2011, Victor White, the, the director of the Squawky French Church, was preparing to retire. At the time, we were going to church at uh, uh, Grinnell First Friends, and there was a member of that church that was on the board, and he said, you know, this is something you ought to consider. You, you seem like you're ready to take the next step in the pastoral care. And we thought about it, we prayed about it, and I said, you know, I don't see myself as a traditional pastor. But, I, but this kind of made sense. I could go to Meskwaki, I could be a part-time pastor, part-time missionary, part-time director of the facilities. I could see myself doing that. So we made the application now. And through the selection process, we were brought in for a couple different interviews. And in one of the second or third interview, they made an amazing discovery. I'm not Native American. <laughs> you're just now figuring this out. Uh, you're, you're, you know what? You're right. I'm not Native American. And they really felt that it would take another Native American to reach out to the other Native Americans at, at that ministry. This is the first time I've really experienced discrimination. And it was very disheartening, very painful. But what I want to share with you today is a story that comes from Jonah. Chapter 1. The word of the Lord came to Jonah. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it. Because of its wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed to Tarshish. He went down to Joppa where he found a ship that was bound for that port. After paying the fare, he went aboard the ship that sailed for Tar Tarshish to flee the Lord. Then the Lord sent a great wind on the sea. Such a violent storm arose. That ship threatened to break apart. All the sailors were afraid, and each one cried out to his own God. They threw cargo overboard to lighten the load of the ship. Did you ever watch the TV show on the Discovery Network, Deadliest Catch? That's what I envisioned these sailors on this ship. They were in this storm. These guys are out there, in Deadliest Catch, they're out there fishing in the middle of the storm. They're tossing those crab cages around. But this storm was so bad, they were in fear of their life. But Jonah had gone below deck where he lay down and fell into a deep sleep. Fell into a deep sleep in the middle of a deadly storm. Insanity. Get up. Call on your God. Maybe he will take notice of us so that we all don't perish. The sailors said to each other, come, let us, let us cast lots to see who is responsible for this calamity. They cast lots and the lots fell on Jonah. So they said to them, tell us who is responsible for making all this trouble for us. What kind of work do you do? Where do you come from? What is your country? Where are your people from? And he answered, I'm a Hebrew, and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, and who made the sea and the dry land. This terrified them, and they asked, what have you done? <laughs> they knew he was running away from the Lord because he'd already told them so. The sea was getting rougher and rougher. So they called him. They said, what should we do to calm the sea to make your God settle down for us? He said, pick me up, throw me into the sea, and it will become calm. I know that it is my fault that this great storm has come upon you. Instead, the men did their best to row back to land, but they couldn't. The sea grew wilder, wilder than before. Then when they cried out to the Lord, please, Lord, don't let us die. For taking this man's life. Do not hold us accountable for killing an innocent man. Please, Lord. Then they took Jonah and threw him overboard, into the in, overboard, and the raging sea grew calm. Just, just like that. Just calm. At this, the men feared the Lord, and they offered sacrifice to the Lord and made vows to him. You ever, you ever do that? Please, Lord, get me out of this. I'll never do it again. And all of a sudden, the seeds go calm. Whew, okay. Done. Now the Lord provided a huge fish that swallowed Jonah. And Jonah went into the belly of the fish for three days and three nights. The next scripture that I want to share with you comes from Jonah 2. The very next chapter. But I'm just going to share verse 1 and verse 10. Verse 
Verse 1 says, From inside the fish, Jonah prayed to the Lord his God. Now, verses 2 through 9 is this beautiful prayer that Jonah said. I'm not going to read that today because in my mind, this is the prayer that Jonah said. God, I offer myself to you to build with me and to do with me as you will. Relieve me of the bondage of myself that I may better do your will. Take away my difficulties that victory over them may be a witness to those I would help. Of your will, your love, and your way of life. May I do your will always. That's the prayer that I heard Jonah say. And then verse 10 says, And the Lord commanded the fish, and it vomited Jonah onto the dry land. I really didn't need to share that, but for the youth here today, I wanted you to think about him in the belly of a fish, and you just got thrown up. You're part of the snot and fish puke onto the dry land. Pretty gross, especially for a Sunday morning. Oh, that wasn't good. No. On that board that decided, that discovered that I wasn't Native American, they forwarded my application that I submitted to them. They forwarded it to Nineveh. I, I mean, Pleasant Plain Friends Church. I was invited to Canada with Pleasant Plain. They were about a pastor. And I said, you know, I, I really appreciate that, but I don't see myself as a traditional pastor. They said, okay. And they said, well, thank you, but no thank you. Then they invited me and said, well, we know you're not interested, but would you be willing to come down and fill the pulpit sometime? Because we've been without a pastor for some time. And I said, well, I'm, I'm kind of busy uh, <laughs> in the middle of race season. Maybe a little later in the year I could do that for you. And one Sunday afternoon, Bernie and I were at Eddie Bell at the racetrack. And things kind of wind down about Sunday noon at the races. And she goes, where exactly is Pleasant Plain? Well, I knew exactly where Pleasant Plain was because that's where my mother went to church. I've been to Pleasant Plain family reunions on several occasions. I said, it's right down the road here. She goes, well, let's go see it. So we drove to Fairfield and then took the back road up into Pleasant Plain. Found the exit ramp into Pleasant Plain. Went right down Main Street. Had every green light through Pleasant Plain. <laughs> I can tell some of you have been to Blizzard. <laughs> the town of about 75 people, including the cats and dogs. And on the west edge of town is Pleasant Plain French Church. Beautiful friends meeting house. We pulled in the driveway and I said, here it is, baby. What do you think? She goes, go back through town. I said, well, why? She goes, I didn't see the cases. And there's a good reason you didn't see the Casey's because there isn't a Casey's in Pleasant Plain, Iowa. The nearest convenience store is five miles away. The nearest high beat and or Walmart is 12 miles away in either direction. This small community nestled into the cornfields of southern southeast Iowa. At the time, we still had a teenage daughter at home, and we had some conversations about selling our house and, and moving to Des Moines so we could really figure out what God wanted us to do. And she goes, I don't think we can do this. I don't think we can drag a teenager who has in the back of her mind that she might be moving to Des Moines soon <laughs> to take her to Pleasant Plain, Iowa, nestle it into a cornfield. So at that point, Bernie and I said to God, thank you, but no thank you. If you're keeping track, that's twice that we have denied God. I accepted a pulpit fill late in the, uh, in the year. And he said, oh, just so you know, we're just going to send you the salary package for Pleasant Plain Friends Church for you to reconsider becoming a candidate. And I opened it and saw what their salary package was. It was exactly half of what I was making as an insurance adjuster traveling the state of Iowa. And I was pretty certain God didn't want me to take a vow of poverty <laughs> to do his will. We went down there, we filled the pulpit. We fell in love with the people. We fell in love with the community. We fell in love with the church. Not the building, the church, the body. So before I was swallowed up by a great fish or vomited on a dry land, we followed God's will for the next an incredible education in pastoral care. 
I haven't been to Berkeley, I haven't been to George Fox. I'm not educated in theology, but I love God's people. I was educated in pastoral care, nursing home visits, funerals, weddings. I was educated in church business. I was educated in the Area Ministerial Association in the Fairfield area, a very strong group of pastors. I was educated in quarterly meeting business. Down there, they have a very active quarterly meeting yet. I was educated in yearly meeting business. And you may find it hard to believe that this little church nestled in the cornfield of Iowa, I received an education in youth ministries. And you're saying, how many kids did you have? I knew I had two or three. But Wilson Friends Church, five miles down the road, they had two or three. Trinity Friends Church, four or five miles down the road, they had two or three. And so we combined our efforts for an area friends youth group that brought other kids from other communities. The Vacation Bible School down in that area combines Pleasant Plain Friends Church, Wilson Friends Church, Trinity Friends Church, Richland United Methodist Church, Hedrick United Methodist Church, St. Joseph's and St. Cabrini Catholic Churches. Seven churches combining their efforts for, for Vacation Bible School. You get about 60, 70 kids. And they ask Bernie Knight to be the director, the, the shepherd or at least herder of cats uh, when you get that many kids in, in, and we bring a whole new energy level to Vacation Bible School. Tremendous education. We had the opportunity to, to uh, direct Camp Quaker Heights last year, the middle school, high school group. What a tremendous education that was. What an exhausting <laughs> time that was. As Bernie and I reflected on Friday after the kids had all gone, we started beating ourselves up, all the things that we did wrong, all the things we could have done different, the things we could have done better. The next morning, that's when the Facebook messages, the textbook mess the text messages started coming in from the kids that were in. <coughs> Specifically, one of those read, thank you for letting God lead our people. In January 2015, Bernie and I went to Mason, Arizona. There was a Team RFC conference, the racing organization that uh, I was a chaplain with. And I really had to discern whether I wanted to go to this conference. It was January. It was Mason, Arizona. <laughs> Boy, there's, there's a difficult decision to be about. And, and my, my parents, Wayne and Martha McDonald, they, they live in Mason, Arizona uh, six months out of the year. So we had a place to stay. It was, it was tough, 70 degrees of sunshine in January, Mesa, Arizona, for only a week. <laughs> and had an opportunity, and I don't know how many of you know this, but Lloyd Mark McDonald was part of the church, French church plant in Phoenix. We had an opportunity to go see that church. It was in the middle of the week, and there was no, not much people there, and we had an opportunity to walk in. I, I was five years old when we moved away from Phoenix. And I thought, oh yeah, I have lots of memories of Phoenix. I don't have one. I don't have one memory. I have memories of all the pictures we took when we lived there, but I don't have a single memory. And it was at that point I turned to Bernie and I said, I really feel like God's calling us south. She said, oh, he's not. I said, you're right, but wouldn't it be great? <laughs> Seven degrees of sunshine, amazing air, something. This is incredible. But she was right, God wasn't calling us south. We got home from that conference in, in Mesa, Arizona, and the only thing on our mind was we got to get ready for vacation Bible school, and we got to get ready for camp. And, there, and if you've ever directed any of these events, there's a lot of administration, a lot of co phone calls, a lot of preparation to go into these things. And so that was really the only thing on our mind. I got a phone call from an interim pastor of another church. I said, interim, he's filling in until they, they found a pastor. He said, uh, they've, they've, uh, they've assembled their search committee. They're getting real serious about finding a pastor for their church. I think you might have some qualities that would really benefit this congregation. Would you consider submitting an application? And this church was closer to home, uh, newer structure, 
kind of intimidating, lar much larger community than Pleasant Plain. I think all communities are probably larger than Pleasant Plain, but this one was substantially larger. And so I told him, I said, uh, thank you for thinking of me, but no thank you. I got a call from Dan Crookshank, the clerk of the Meskwaki Board. He said, you know, about four years ago, you and Bernie had applied for to be the director of Meskwaki Friends Church. Would you consider coming back? I told him, no, thank you. Actually, what I told him was a lot worse than no thank you, but no thank you is what I'm going to share with you this morning. <laughs> My feelings had been so hurt, I wanted nothing to do with that place. We're not advancing slides, but that's okay. I'm just going to tell you the story. I went to uh, Blizzard Blast, and at Blizzard Blast, a pastor approached me. He says, Mac, I really need to talk to you. He says, I want you to know on Sunday morning I'm submitting my resignation. He says, my wife and I have been praying about it, but we think you and Bernie would be great candidates to, to replace us. This particular pastor, I had a tremendous amount of respect for him. He's highly educated, very enthusiastic. How could I ever fill his shoes? I said, I'm flattered. I'm truly honored and humbled that you would think of us. But thank you, but no thank you. But what did become apparent that God was ready for Bernie and I to move. However, we had no idea where. We prayed over all three opportunities. In a French church, we call it assembling a clearness committee. We did that. We called on some of our personal prayer warriors and explained to them this is what was on our heart. And we, we had no idea where God wanted us to go. We actually went on a prayer pilgrimage. We traveled to each one of these locations, sat in the parking lot, Pray to God, where do you want us to go? So I submitted an application to all three locations. Somebody accused me of casting my nets. I said, I'm not casting my nets. I said, God's ready for us to move, and I have no idea where he wants us to go. All I know is I am willing. It became pretty clear. The first church that uh, we applied to said, thank you, but no thank you. And I didn't have a problem with that. All that did was close one door. The most funky board, and I had several conversations. But most of those conversations are what changes do you need to make for the next guy who might come in here? It wasn't me, but it was the other guy. And the third church was awesome. It was very near my hometown, where my parents spent six months out of the year. They had an energetic, Bunch of young adults. A tremendous youth program. They have a large number of seniors that are financially secure that support, financially support these young adults and these youth that go out and serve. That's exciting. It's near my family. It's near Camp Quaker Heights. In my mind, this was a pastor's golden ticket. Keep you. What more can a pastor ask for? We like them. Stranger, yet they like us. They narrowed the camp to see down to one person, and that was me. I said, but you need to know I have one more meeting with the Meskwaki board. I was open to all three locations, letting them know what I was doing. I had no idea where God was leading me, but... So I sat down for one last board meeting with the board of the Swanky Friends Church. And the first thing that was said at that meeting was, this is not an interview. And I said, good, because I don't want this job. The next thing that was said, halfway through that meeting, God spoke very clearly to me. And here's what God said. Go to the city of Tama, Iowa, preach against it because of its wickedness has come up before me. Well, that's not exactly what God said. But he did say that in so many words that this is where I want you to go. So before I was swallowed up by a great fish or vomited onto dry land, as of August 15, or August 1st, 2015, 
where I became the pastor and co-directors of the Squawking Friends Church. We followed God's leading. We are continuing to follow God's leading. We went there with all its uncertainty, all its darkness, all its physical work, all its financial needs. But better yet, we went there with all of its beauty, with all of its glory, with all of its potential, and all of its people. And we ran headfirst into the storm to serve the one and only risen Savior. Matthew 28, verse 16 through 20 says, The eleven disciples went to Galilee to, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him. And some of them doubted. Okay, there's 12 disciples. Some of them doubted. Okay, yeah, there's Thomas. <laughs> then Jesus said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of time. I encourage you today. Where or what is your enemy? What are you running away from? How can you serve him better? In the French church, we have a tradition. It's odd, the French church is pretty much has a tradition against tradition, but this is one we kind of stick by. We call it open worship and communion. We don't partake in the sacrament of communion in the physical sense. But we believe that leading a life like Jesus is a sacrament in itself. Please join me in a time of that open worship and communion. Clear your hearts and your thoughts. Let God speak to you. Maybe he'll tell you specifically where your name is today. Where you can go serve. You don't physically have to go anywhere to serve. And this time of our holy community.